Budget Committee is back in session. Thank you very much. Next up on our agenda is Health, Housing, and Human Services, or H3S, as we like to refer to it. Mr. Rich Swift, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Richard Swift with Health, Housing, and Human Services. Uh, so I'm going to start off by making some introductions. And these are the, uh, the folks in my department who help me run the department, who are also potentially going to be up here um, answer, helping me answer questions related to, de to details. So starting from my right, your left, Vahid Brown, who is in the uh, director's office. He is the housing policy coordinator and advisor for the department, has been instrumental in helping us deal with our houseless problem. I have Ed Jones. He's here uh, substituting for uh, Deborah Cockrell, who is in Bend at an opioid conference. He's the finance administrator manager for mm -hmm. the health centers. I have James Wilson right next to him. He is, what's, what's actually your new title now? He is the chief operating officer for the health centers. He is also here uh, to help with some questions, and that also speaks to how large the health centers are. Mary Rumbaugh, uh, right next to James. She's the behavioral health director. I have uh, Brenda. She is the director of, uh, Brenda Durbin, director of SSD, Social Services Division. Uh, Rod Cook, who is actually um, occupying uh, two roles. He is the director of children, family, and community uh, connections. And he is also um, actually starting officially on the third, the deputy director for the department. And also uh, this, after, this evening, um, filling in for me at a public event. So I appreciate that. Julie Albers, uh, to the left there at the end, she is helping me run the public health division since I am currently also the public health director uh, for the county. And then behind Julie is Chuck Robbins, who is the director of CD, Community Development. So um, what I also like to do right now, and I talked a little bit about this previously, is I'd like uh, Chuck uh, to come up here and join me, and I'd also like Linda Anderson to come up here and join me. Mm -hmm. So it is my intention to um, acknowledge and also take the opportunity to embarrass them a little bit. Um, so the reason I'm doing this is because both of these folk are retiring this year. And uh, Chuck, to my left, has been here. And I had to actually write this down and use my phone to do the math on it because um, it went back that far. So Chuck, his hire date was March 14th, 1979. And he has Whoa. been with... Um, People here weren't even born there. I know. <laughs> and you know, they make that very, very clear to me. <laughs> Don't worry, Chuck. You're not alone, brother. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, these days, since I turned 55 on Thursday, it's I don't get very often to actually make comments like I was trying to figure out if I was in eighth grade still or if I was a freshman. <laughs> um, so, and he has been with uh, community development all that entirety except for his stint um, as the housing authority director for five years. And so, sort of like a baseball player or football player who left his original team, we've brought him back into community development so that he could retire. Um, and then to my right is Linda Anderson. She was hired September 10th, 1984. Uh, she has been with the department 35 years. So between these two wow. individuals, we have 75 years worth of service to the county. Um, this is actually their brains before they leave. Yeah. You know? So Linda has also occupied uh, a single spot in the department, which is the director's office. She's been in the director's office this entirety of time, and so she holds a level of institutional knowledge that. She is a department's encyclopedia. She actually helps me when I have questions about certain things, and she can reach back and has an instantaneous answer. She goes back across, I don't know, how many directors? Uh, five. Just five, oh. Hmm. Um, so it actually speaks to the, you know, I think the uh, length of leadership that we've had in the department, and, um, and it's been, I think, Linda who has made that possible, uh, who's provided that stability. So. This is a huge loss for us this year. Um, I, I've been um, dreading this, but they both earned their retirement. So thank you both. You're very welcome. Thank you, Rich. All right. All right. And I get to embarrass you at some point, right? You do. Right. You do. <laughs> Actually, don't you thank do you that often? Thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you for your service. Thank you. 
so Mr. Swift, I also uh, want to point out that what we've been trying to do is a lot 50% of the time for presentation and 50% of the time for Q&A from the Budget Committee. With your department today, we have a little bit of an anomaly in that we have a break scheduled in between there. But at that point in time, I'll see if we actually need to do that or if we want to just carry through sure. and get to the end point. In the discussion you and I had, um, there was certainly every indication that your part of it would not necessarily take the 45 minutes or so that we may have scheduled for that. So we'll see how the timing goes, okay. if that's all right. With that is perfectly committee acceptable. And with you, sir. I know that you all have Mr. been Sardis, doing this for quite a, a while. Comment? Yeah, I'm just curious because you're going you're to break this down by departments, so to speak sub-departments within, right? So as I'm looking at your budget, I'm just kind of wondering if if it's hard to probably forecast for you how to spend the time, but if it was by department, we could ask the questions by department, And but there again, it's, it's your show, so. What I was intending to do was actually present the department uh, in its entirety and then take question and answers related to what the budget committee wishes to do. So if there are particular yeah. divisions that the committee wishes to dive into, then we can certainly address that in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. And if there were things that um, other folks needed to answer, most of your folks are in the room and Absolutely. would be able to mm -hmm. come up and speak to that, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Thank yep. You. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Proceed, sir. All right, thank, thank you. you. So the mission of the of H3S uh, is to remove barriers for vulnerable individuals and families on their path to improve health, wellness, prosperity, and inclusion. So towards that end, the department's budget request for FY20 is 150 150 million and change. Um, so as you can see, it's down from last year. Uh, part of this has to do with uh, you know reductions in federal and state funding for the most part. But from the standpoint of this much money, uh, what you're looking at is essentially a, a fairly stable budget. I think it's important to note that uh, the state is not done with its biennial process. And so we are going to be waiting to see what happens uh, from the state as we move forward with our budget. So there, we would end up dealing with that um, in a supplemental budget as, we, uh, as the, this budget committee approves the county's budget. We would then provide some adjustments depending on what happens with the state uh, in the supplemental budget process following. So uh, what we have here are some key performance measures and results. And what I'll do is walk through those and again at the end of this uh, sort of take questions on those measures. So the first strategic result for the department is by 2022, 95% of all residents seeking behavioral health services will receive a response within one business day of expressing their need. So in FY18, our actual was 85%, and our target um, for FY19 is 85%. Actuals to date as of December were at 88%, and so what the behavioral health has done is decided to adjust that target upwards, and our target following will be 95% of individuals who express a desire for behavioral health services being contacted within one day, which is actually, uh, given the level of behavioral health uh, issues and need we are facing in the county, uh, fairly stupendous uh, in terms of response. The next uh, result, percent of job seekers in the county funded programs who retain employment for 90 days out of the number who obtain employment, uh, this is our workforce. So in FY18, our actual was 80%. The target is 55, and I've been actually talking with Rodney about adjusting that since clearly they're outperforming their target quite consistently. Uh, FY19 is 82% with a target of 55% of for FY20. So I'm expecting that uh, we'll probably be adjusting that 55% target. So that also um, is a fairly outstanding number because in this result, what the folks in workforce are doing, they are working with uh, individuals who are some of the hardest to employ and work with, uh, people with behavioral health issues, folks who've been out of the workforce for a fairly long time, or those who are um, wrestling with addiction. The next result, percent of clients attending two or more sessions who show a reduction in their global distress. So global distress, and this is within our behavioral health uh, clinics. Global distress is a series of 12 questions that is asked at each session. They are in front of their therapist where they walk through uh, how the person is generally feeling, their sense of safety, things that they're struggling with, and they do this in each session. And so what you have there for FY18, the actual 76%, uh, the target is 80%, and then um, FY19, actual 79% with a target of 80%. 
And so, you know, the behavioral health centers are doing a, a nice job of addressing uh, the stress for folks in the county regarding their mental illness and the management of that illness. Opioid prescriptions per 1,000 1, residents. This is through public health and our um, ACRS opioid reduction initiative. Uh, and we have several different initiatives that are in play regarding our opioids, which FY18, across 1,000 individuals, 183 uh, scripts per individual uh, per 1,000. FY19 actual is 182. Uh, FY19 actual as of uh, December 31st was again 182. That was within the target, and then our target is uh, 178. And so, you know, here this is an issue that, of course, is getting national attention. You've got lawsuits occurring across all the states. Our Oregon is participating. You know, Oklahoma settled with Purdue Pharma, which was one of the biggest. They're going ahead with a lawsuit of Johnson & Johnson. I'm not, I don't have an update for where uh, Oregon is with their lawsuits. These are some big money suits um, that are playing out nationally. Uh, we still struggle with this in the um, county and in the region and in the state in regards to addictions. I think it's important, and this is uh, something that uh, going forward, you know, we're going to be attending to, is that opioid addiction has been an issue in this country for a very long time before the opioid crisis was declared. We had brown and black communities that were being hammered by heroin for a very, very long time, dating back to the 60s. And uh, it was never a crisis. Actually, it was a war. And so suddenly we have a crisis across the Caucasian population of this country, and it is labeled a crisis. And so this has been an issue. Every time I talk about this in public, I bring it up because it's something that we need to address. Uh, we still are somewhat bifurcated in our uh, approach to this in the sense that it's a concentration of opioids. In ACE3S, we've been focusing more, generally speaking, across the general populations that we work with with opioids. It's not just about the pills. It's also about heroin coming into the county. Let's see, next result. Percent of routine license facilities inspections completed within the year. So this is for environmental health and public health. The FY18 actual was 90 percent. The FY19 target was 90, is 90 percent. For uh, FY19, actuals are 88 percent, and the target going forward for FY20 is 20, 90 percent. So that 2 percent drop off there that you see is due to the fact that we've had a vacancy within environmental health. Uh, we've had conversations with the Board of County Commissioners regarding our environmental health fees. There was an agreement that we would go forward with full recovery of, of those fees uh, at next time the county sets um, its fee schedule, and this will allow us to actually hire that last vacant position, and I expect that uh, next time I'm in front of the Budget Committee, I'll be reporting that we have met that target. This is an important um, result for the county because what you're talking about is uh, inspections of uh, all public food places, swimming pools, et cetera. And these are things that we uh, want clean and not um, transmitting infections or disease. And uh, the environmental health folk do a fantastic job. Uh, we're quite proud of them uh, because they are all over this county doing their work. Uh, the next is percent of families that are healthy, stable, and attached. That's within Rod's shop of children, family, community connections. The actual is 92%. Uh, the target is 85%. And then the actual for FY 1994 with the target of 95. So that, again, may be a, another conversation I'm going to be having with Rodney about his targets because um, he's clearly outperforming those targets. Uh, yep. Excuse me. Madam Chairman, can we ask questions? Sure, go ahead. Along? Briefly, on I'd like to get through thing. the presentation, but yes, Thank you may, you. You may right. do so. I, I, I'm looking at percent of families that are healthy, stable, and attached. Is that, is that all of the population of Clackamas County families, or is that families that you work with specifically? These are families that we work with specifically. Thank you. Good question. Good clarification. Thank you. So then strategic result for FY. Uh, by 2019, 90% of the H3S employee satisfaction surveys will indicate that employees are showing each other respect and support. So for FY18, uh, the result reported back from employees was uh, just a touch over 82%. Uh, the target for FY19 is 89. Uh, our actual for FY19 was 90%, just a touch, and then our target for FY20 is 90%. You know, 
my desire for that is actually 100 percent in, in all honesty uh, so that's what we strive for we do quite a bit of work in supporting employees and addressing diversity equity and inclusion issues across the department uh, I don't know that we'll ever actually get to 100 percent but I would certainly like to be able to report that um, that we're working towards that um, so the next slide budget reductions so I think one of the things that's important to note for us in terms of our budget reductions is the fact that uh, we, um, across the, the $150 million or so of our budget, um, you know, I think this year it's just a touch over $11 million that we get in terms of general fund. And so what you're going to see here representative of that fact is that some of our, that our budget reductions are not going to be paralleling what some of the other departments have experienced. So our reductions are totaling uh, 461823 which is, which was actually 5% of our maintenance level budget. So that was taken across the department. So what that essentially meant uh, was that the divisions that were experiencing um, those cuts, where we had issues, uh, primarily where I had issues, public health, we did some uh, internal uh, movement of dollars to, to fill gaps. Um, primarily, I actually uh, moved $140,000 million, 140 million, $140, out of my budget into public health to help with their gap. Um, and as a result, public health did take, they took no reductions in the budget pro process. Um, public health received that, as I spoke. They also received a one-time contribution from the general fund, which we were extremely grateful for. Uh, because I th we would have then actually been in uh, reduction in force and we probably would have had to have eliminated at least two positions. Um, and that's where those program fees in terms of full cost recovery came in and were uh, deeply, deeply appreciated. Uh, the rest of those cuts absorbed across the department were for administration, uh, 94,000, behavioral health, uh, almost 50,000, social services, 163,000, community development. Um, <laughs> $2,500, and that also speaks to the fact that community development, by and large, receives little or no general fund. Uh, children, family, and community connections, $121,000, and health centers, $30,000. So there you see the two big um, parts of our department where we receive a, a good chunk of dollars, social services, and CFCC in terms of general fund. And of course, as I spoke, public health uh, took no cuts because of their um, budget issues. And so those were essentially the reductions for the department as related to our general fund. And then aging populations uh, are, are emerging issues. So, it, you know, it, it was interesting to listen to the conversation um, with uh, Sherry Hall and her staff that was previous to this in regards to some of the pressures they're facing with an aging population. And Good. the things that they have to do to adapt to helping that population vote. And so we are also dealing with uh, aging population pressures. Uh, focused on, you know, the fact that the number of residents over the age of 60 is, in this county is projected to double in the next 25 years. This will stress our safety net systems. This will stress our ability to allow folks to age in place. This will be also a stress related to the amount of savings that this population has as they age. Uh, healthcare has been successful at um, helping people live longer as they age. One of those issues too, though, means sometimes folks outlive their savings. Uh, lack of home care workers is also another big issue where we do not have the workforce to help folks age you know, in home, and so um, that'll be something that we're going to be uh, dealing with. Uh, Oregon Project Independence, um, and this is in Brenda's shop, they do a beautiful job of providing services to our aging population. This is something that the state is committed to, and so we're just going to keep plugging away, but this will be an issue that we will be, I'm sure, uh, presenting as we go forward this year and following years. The volunteer pool for social services is rapidly aging, um, and this means that we have a number of, uh, we have a, a growing gap in terms of what our volunteer needs. They do a, uh, a beautiful job of getting folks volunteering across the community, and we are seeing that pool overall shrink, shrink and shrinking rapidly. Um, you know, where this plays out is folks providing transportation, uh, meals and wheels, and in this is something that's coming a more common occurrence for us to have conversations about this dwindling uh, volunteer workforce. 
So we're not exactly sure what we're going to do. We're going to be focusing on this and working with PGA to get out the call that we you know we need volunteers of all ages. It can't just be um, our aging retired population. Um, and then patients having increase, increasingly complex health care needs. This is in particular related to uh, behavioral health as we see behavioral health needs climbing in the county. And I'll touch on that uh, in just a second. So housing concerns. Everyone I think here is at this point uh, oriented to the houseless problem we're experiencing in the, re in the region. So we have significant need for affordable housing across all income levels in the county. Uh, we have projections across the region of a need of 84,000 units plus um, across all income levels. And particularly in particular income levels where it drops below 60% of income where we um, have a, an enormous gap that we are trying to, we're working hard to try and fill. The Metro Bond is both a challenge and an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to fill and help with those below 60%. The issue there is the Metro Bond also will more than likely not, it, it just, it will not make a dent or it'll make a tiny dent and then uh, we are still going to have our issue. So the county will be faced with this and there will be questions for the county in terms of, um, I know no one likes to hear this, but does the county wish to tax itself to help with this type of issue? This will have to be a consideration in my opinion. Lack of supportive services to help vulnerable individuals and families retain their current or improved housing situation. So this relates to, for example, with the housing authority whose budget we won't be entertaining today, is supportive housing. It's those wrap services that allow individuals to uh, maintain their housing. And without this, many individuals uh, lose their housing. And so what happens for us is we get a turnstile where folks are entering and then leaving, entering and leaving. For example, with the Vets Village, this is uh, actually, it's been a great model for us in terms of showing that uh, having transitional units, and the pods are not perfect in terms of what we would like for transitional units, but it has allowed us to uh, engage with individuals. It's allowed individuals to relax, to feel a sense of safety, and then they can focus on other things. One of the things the pods have given the vets who resided there is the gift of time. They actually get a chance to do their laundry, take showers, eat on a regular basis. And with those needs being met, then it is uh, a much easier and organized task for, for caseworkers to engage with them and then move them into permanent housing. And actually, it has been a successful model. It's not exactly what we would like it to be, but it's a start, and it has been a good start. Public health, uh, the underfunding of essential mandated services continues to cause substantial budget concerns. I discussed those earlier. Uh, you know, going for, and so this will be an issue uh, as we go into FY21. You know, the, the dollars that came into public health at this point to help, which is essentially uh, $290,000, you know, was those, are, that's, those are plugs. The, that's not guaranteed dollars going forward for FY21. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Smith uh, wishes to guarantee my 150. Um, so, and public health is facing also increasing uh, issues as it relates to global uh, climate change. As the climate gets warmer, we see diseases that we have not seen for a very long time or ever in this area uh, in terms of infectious diseases. And this puts in intense pressures on our disease investigators as it relates to those issues. And we expect to see that climb. Behavioral health reductions in Medicaid funding. Boy, I'm really beginning to sound like a, a complete downer here. Reductions in, in Medicaid funding uh, in 2020 due to the CCO 2.0 and changes in the role of the counties. Uh, Mary uh, Rumbaugh and her staff have done a beautiful job of working with Health Share of Oregon as it relates to those changes and playing out and planning for how we are going to manage and maintain our role, a robust role in the provision of behavioral health services. The suicide rate in Clackamas County remains high. We are also seeing that climb within particular age groups, 25, 26 years and below. And um, this is something of deep concern. Increased need for behavioral health services across the county's uh, 10 school districts. We've been working with the Sheriff's Office, uh, juvenile in terms of our threat of harm assessment system across all 10 school districts. We have two positions dedicated to that and we're doing a fair amount of lifting related to that. That threat of harm uh, system is essentially identification of students who are experiencing behavioral health issues. This is not a, about identifying who is going to bring a shotgun into uh, school. This is a, about identifying who, um, who, which child and their families are experiencing intense behavioral health pressures. 
uh, campus construction and growth. For us, Hilltop and Stewart will, will need to be relocated. They'll be need to be closed. And so we are working on where to recite those, and that is, um, you know, a budget pressure for both us and the county. Beaver Creek and Sunnyside Clinic buildings are over capacity, and so we are looking at um, what to do about that. And one of the things we are looking at is expansion of services into Sandy. So uh, we are closing, hopefully be going to be closing on a building. I think we are probably actually closed, aren't we, Chuck? Yes. yes. So we have a building up in Sandy we have closed on, and we are going to be expanding health care services and establishing a new primary care uh, clinic. That will be an integrated clinic in the sense of behavioral health, physical health, and dental up in Sandy, and that is def definitely needed. And then client growth in, in, our, in some of our programs like development of disabilities has outpaced our ability to recruit and hire qualified applicants. So we have a workforce issue. And we're experiencing this workforce issue not just within DD. We're experiencing this workforce issue within behavioral health as well. We have that. And this is recognized in healthcare across the region. Uh, and then also related to outreach to our rural residents, you know, our capacity um, is also outpaced there because what we end up doing there is we don't actually have district offices out in the rural areas. What we have are um, you know, staff driving. And so the question is, do their cars become their offices? And we move them out so we can deal with also overcrowding across some of our um, work areas within PSB. So uh, that's the, those issues. And as promised, I leave it open for questions. Thank you so much, sir. You are welcome. I appreciate that. Commissioner Bernard. So I, I wanted to mention that when we were talking about the fee structure, uh, I had some concerns about food carts. And I've had the opportunity to go out and do inspections with some of your staff. And I had an opportunity to talk to one of those staff members about the uh, the demand on a f on inspecting food carts, how lots of folks uh, think, well, I'm a good cook, I'm going to open a food cart, not thinking that you can only serve a certain amount and you have to have refrigeration and, and stations and that um, it often requires numerous inspections to actually be completed before they can do what they want to do. Um, I remember one time somebody saying that they found one of the food cart uh, folks um, at, at, or at a farmer's market who actually did their work in a barn and then brought it to the market to sell, a dirt floor barn. Um, so I, I don't go to that restaurant. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing I think about is that you, uh, aging population, at least assuming the federal government doesn't screw up our health insurance, they'll have health insurance. Medicaid or Medicare, whatever it's sure. called. Mm -hmm. At least uh, that's a, a positive opportunity. Um, a climate change, uh, I think it would be great uh, to talk in the future about what are the health impacts and what are the diseases we need to be prepared for in Clackamas County? Should I go get a shot mm -hmm. on such and such because that disease is more prevalent as climate change occurs. Um, I also just want to say that I just, I, I'm impressed with the work that Fahid's doing and we are doing at the county to address homelessness or houselessness. And, um, and I'm really happy that we're, uh, when I first got here, we were going to close all our health clinics. We were really uh, looking to go to a, a, a provider. Uh, but the board at the time changed the direction. And, and now we're back in Sandy. And I really uh, uh, been wanting to do this a long time. And your efforts on, uh, and your staff efforts to secure a facility, to invest in, in providing health care. Uh, in Sandy, I'm really proud to, that we were able to succeed in that. So thank you. No, you're welcome, as am I. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher, then Commissioner Savas. Yeah, just to clarify on your emerging issues, it says reduction in Medicaid funding in 220 due to CCO 2.0 and changes in role of counties. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like you to expand on that. What does that actually mean? 
Sure. So what I'm going to do is give actually, because Mary's done so much work in this area and has done such a fantastic job, I'm going to give her an opportunity to come up here. I could talk about this, um, but I really do want to acknowledge, you know, uh, let me just to sort of describe this from the work that Mary has done. So back fall and the winter, it seemed like it went on for quite a while. I participated in negotiations with, you know, 10 other healthcare organizations regarding Health Share of Oregon and whether that organization was going to be going forward in an application with uh, CCO 2.0 uh, for the state. So the, the state had put out, was going to be putting out their request for applications. So it was in, I think it was in November after what seemed like interminable meetings, some of them intensely frustrating, that the organizations came together and voted to submit a joint application which was actually a pretty significant victory. So that was a fair amount of work, but then also we picked up a fair amount of work, which meant then we were going to have to do that um, application, which was massive. Mary actually, for the most part, led the um, application part as related to behavioral health, which was, um, I don't know, how many pages was it? Uh, our portion was 66 pages. It was the longest section with over 100 questions we had to answer. So, and she, and she was the one who did the bulk of that work. When I actually, if I needed to meet with Mary, I actually uh, just went over to HealthShare <laughs> and drove over there because it seemed like she was spending the majority of her time. And so what I'll do is allow her to um, dive into this and address your uh, questions, Commissioner Fisher, as it relates to how this is playing out. So thank you, Commissioner. Um, so currently, uh, the Behavioral Health Division um, actually has a formal relationship with HealthShare of Oregon as a, what is called a risk accepting entity. So they delegate, um, we lovingly call it array, um, and uh, so they delegate the management of the mental health and substance use benefit to uh, each of the three counties in that role. So we uh, negotiate our uh, Medicaid funding uh, with them to cover uh, the, the uh, sort of administrative uh, functions um, uh, of those duties. And so we receive a, a monthly capitation payment um, so that we can cover things like utilization review, care coordination, all, all the things that really come with being a public health insurance. As part of the work that was done last fall in December um, with the restructuring of um, health share amongst the members, the three counties will no longer have a formal relationship as a risk accepting ent entity starting in 2020. Uh, what we will receive is a committed off the top funding from Health Share of Oregon uh, to continue to fund our crisis safety net services. So currently that is part of our negotiation with our capitation as we, we negotiate various lines of business uh, for the, that funding. So there is a committed a dollar amount yet to be determined but certainly a commitment from Health Share of Oregon recognizing that we are truly the safety net even for Oregon Health Plan members. We um, Over 60% of individuals who come to our urgent mental health walk-in clinic are actually on the Oregon Health Plan. Um, and many of them are also on commercial insurance. So, so we are the first stop for those individuals. Um, and then we will uh, be working with Care Oregon will become in this new structure, um, the um, really the public health plan, our, um, excuse me, the public insurance plan for both primary care, um, dental, and the specialty behavioral health. Uh, what they will do is they will negotiate with us um, uh, funding to continue to provide some of the local work that we're doing around specialty care coordination. So uh, in, uh, children and families who have complex mental health needs, we will continue to be uh, their care coordinator through our what, what is called a wraparound program. Individuals going in and out of the state hospital, uh, that's called our choice program. We will continue to be funded um, with, for those individuals. But we will expect to see a, a reduction not yet identified reduction of Medicaid because our, our relationship will just be different. Um, so that that's really the biggest change at this point. Okay, so I have a follow-up. <laughs> so our wonderful attorney, Stephen Madcor, gave the Budget Committee these pages of what the county's responsibility is for all um, aspects of our duties. And one of what's written in here is under mental health services, a county must provide emergency psychiatric care, custody, and treatment. The county must contribute to a state fund to pay for these services. If that fund is exhausted, a county must directly pay for these services, ORS 426-241.
So with that, my question for you is, are the funds from the state adequate to meet the needs in our community in regards to these mandates? And if not, what is the shortfall? So Commissioner Fisher, I, I believe what that's referencing is um, our role um, as the local mental health authority and community mental health program around probably civil commitment. They're not using that exact term. Um, um, that, that's actually language I, that I'm actually not fully familiar with because it's probably just a difference of, of language. Um, currently, uh, we receive um, uh, what is probably adequate funding uh, with likely a reduction. Um, so what's happening, if we're really talking about the civil commitment process, so this, this is a pretty high threshold for uh, um, individuals experiencing a mental health uh, crisis who are a danger to themselves or others who are put on either um, a designee custody, a police custody, a two-party petition. There's, there's varying uh, levels of, of sort of holds that happen for these individuals. And then it is our responsibility to go in and determine whether we will be recommending that that individual go to hearing for a commitment. And there is a pretty high threshold um, for that, and ultimately the judge decides whether that is going to happen or not. Uh, what is actually happening is um, some challenges with state reporting uh, indicating that civil commitments across the, across the state, including in our county, are going down in numbers. So there is um, current conversation about reducing the dollars allocated to counties uh, because the numbers are going down in spite of all of our efforts to show that our numbers are going up. So that is actually a current um, sort of quote battle that we're having with the state around their reporting system and where, where it appears that they are not getting adequate reporting from us. So currently we have three individuals who are our investigators. Uh, they work Monday through Friday, they go to court two days a week. Um, because our numbers have overall, uh, when you look at his history, historical numbers have gone down, um, that is a manageable um, amount of individuals that we, are, we have to investigate. Um, but certainly um, we could do more uh, if we had additional dollars. So I'm really trying to understand the unmet need. So if you go to any of our places where you go to Father's Heart, you go to our Clackamas Service Center, you go to certain areas and you talk with people. There was one gentleman that I talked to when I was doing the homeless count and I said, are you, do you have anybody that's with you? Or do you have family members that are with you? And he said, well, if you count the voices in my head. Yeah. And this was a gentleman that wasn't even um, eligible or hadn't applied for social security disability and he was, you know, 40, 50 years old, definitely had some mental health issues homeless, living on the street for many, many years in Oregon City, grew up in Oregon City. Mm -hmm. I just think of him and think, okay, we're not obviously meeting our um, needs of caring for people that have significant mental health challenges. Absolutely. I, I think that it is no secret that we um, historically behavioral health, and that includes mental health and substance use, um, and many folks struggle with both, have been, has been an underfunded and overregulated system. And so we have many providers who have just, they, they, they have just gotten out of the, the business, right? Um, because it, there's so much reporting and regulation around it. And I think there's a recognition that we have to fund uh, behavioral health better. It, it flows through every conversation we have, um, the impact of mental health and, and substance use um, and people's ability to maintain housing and jobs, parent their children. So, so I think there's a recognition with a lack of uh, ability to decide at the end of the day to prioritize funding, both in Medicaid and really what you're talking about, then non-Medicaid. And those are the dollars I receive through uh, my, my role as the local mental health authority and community mental health program is really to serve those individuals who are uninsured or underinsured. Now we as a state, because of the Affordable Care Act, has we've done a great job of getting the majority of the people. We have a high percentage of individuals that are on Medicaid. That's wonderful. We actually don't have enough capacity within the behavioral health system to serve all of those individuals. So while we, um, here at our behavioral health clinics, we have open access so people can come same day and be seen. 
in many parts of our provider system, it's three, four, five, six weeks before you're going to get an intake. And it's even longer if you need to see a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner. So, and, and I... Money is important, but we also have a workforce sh shortage. So I, I could pay our providers really, really well. They can't hire fast enough um, because people are, and what will happen is you'll end up funding a provider really well, and they'll em end up hiring from their next door provider. So now it, it's, it's just that constant um, sort of, you know, unintended consequence of, of really trying to build up the workforce. So it's both, it's certainly both funding um, but it's also a, a workforce issue for us. I mean, what you see there in terms of that capacity is you look at the, at the catch points for the lack of capacity, and those are the streets mm -hmm. and their jails. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the census and the jails, what you have is, and I've talked to Sheriff Roberts about this, is their census is probably anywhere from 60 to 40 percent in terms of how you do that count of mental health and addictions issues that are being captured in the jail. So if, if we actually were upstream on this, uh, we wouldn't actually have to build a, uh, if we were going to build a new jail, we could build a larger jail, or excuse me, a smaller jail, because we would be dealing with this addictions and behavioral health issues. And this is part of the tying to the system for threat of harm and identification of behavioral health issues in the schools. We identify this early, and then we can work with individuals and their families in terms of how to manage that disease process. Because for most folks, a lot of the mental illness um, you know, starts in the teens, it can start earlier, and then, and the younger this is addressed, uh, the better off an individual is in terms of being able to manage that disease process. It does not have to be something that is um, completely unmanaged where an individual winds up uh, in the company of the voices in their own head living on the streets. Thank you. Commissioner Savas? Yeah. Well, being that Mary's up there, I'll just just want to say say this as I heard. Um, I think that statute re, um, relates to those that are in a, a a here and now mental crisis, and just like anyone having a, a medical emergency that's not a mental health, we those people need to be treated right away. And I think that's what I think that statute is. But certainly, I think abroad, almost in every spectrum of everything you all do, there's a capacity challenge. Um, you know, as far as people that do regular mental health care, for example, which you'd serve, so I think you spoke to that. Um, so thank you for all your work, and it was a pleasure um, joining you all um, uh, on a couple Sundays ago on the NAMI walk. So, yeah, it was um, great having you. Yeah. So but, could I just briefly speak to, though, um, Commissioner Savas, um, that clarification? So um, a, a new statute that came into effect um, about two years ago was the requirement of all counties to respond uh, with 24-7 uh, mobile crisis response to any individual who is experiencing a mental health condition. Uh, we currently are funded for five individuals who are covering both day and swing shift, and then we have an on-call, um, somebody who's always on call. So we are meeting that mandate of 24-7, but really, ideally, if we were more adequately funded, you would actually have live people, not, not sort of the on-call system with that ability, and we're, requ we're required to respond within one hour. Um, the state has classified us as an urban county, and then we are required to report quarterly on, on if we're meeting that. We meet it about 95% of the time. If we have to go up to the mountain, we obviously are not going to meet that one hour uh, requirement. Um, so just again, speaking to Commissioner Fisher's um, point is I think the state at least did make some targeted effort to fund specifically that mandate and that came out of the, the Department of Justice settlement with the state hospital or with the Oregon Health Authority regarding the state hospital, lovingly called the Oregon Performance Plan. Um, but we, if we received more additional funding, we would, we would, that, that would be where we would absolutely invest our do dollars because it's a mandated requirement. Okay, great, thank you. Um, going back to the bigger picture um, on uh, tab 17, page 76, for those who wish to follow, um, I, getting back to the carryover, um, which is, it uh, looks like $30 million, $31 million. Um, and uh, I was reflecting on last year's budget topic and um, 
when we were talking about the carryover and my goal then and maybe today or suggestion today is how we put that to use um, for those in need, knowing that we have need for dollars in all these ways. So, and I look back and I try to find it to see where the lion's share of that is. And the biggest one I could find were the health care centers, right? The health centers, yeah. They have a reserve, I think, somewhere around $14 million right now. Right, right, I, which I saw. Um, I couldn't really find all the, the balance, the remainder of that, mm -hmm. the $16 million or so of that. But my question is, uh, with regard to um, alcohol and drug treatment, mm -hmm. is that an eligible use of those funds? So if we were providing, you know, providing those services within the health centers, within the, the span of the FQHC, it certainly is an eligible use, uh, and they can certainly do that. And so part of those reserves are going to be used for the development of the Sandy Clinic. So I expect in FY20, or when we're preparing the FY21 bu budget, what you'll see is that that um, reserve has been uh, spent down to some degree because we've been using, we'll be using that for that facility development. Okay. And I, I appreciate, because I can see um, on the graph on that very same page, um, on page uh, 76, the, um, the, your ending fund balance, so to speak, your carryover is going down, so you're putting those dollars mm -hmm. to use, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just kind of wanted to say that um, looking at the, we talk about supportive housing and then looking at the models in which that seems to have relatively good success, there's also, as a component of that, but separate, um, it seems, it, like the Los Angeles area is um, having sobering centers or, or drug and mm -hmm. alcohol treatment centers, which mm -hmm. are standalone, so to speak, right. part, but part of the system, you know, part of the large system. So I'm just realizing as I look at our capacity in the region for drug and alcohol treatment that we don't really don't have that depth of capacity. We do for, not. Exactly. So I, I think that somehow, I don't know how is, it, how is that being addressed to, if, if the goal is more on the supportive housing side um, and you know, the model that I kind of like, that I've seen Central City Concern have with their housing is that you know, that's part of their whole program. Is mm -hmm. that So they offer that. That's part of their regiment. Um, but how's that shaping? How's that going to shape up for us as a region? I mean, is that capacity coming to provide that level of service? Because, you know, we, you know, the, I think the recent uh, video from Seattle, Seattle's Dying, uh, really a lot of attention has been drawn to that drug care. And, of course, those are people that, if they are incarcerated, right, that's part of their treatment of getting out is a, per and, but, but also after they're out on the street released and productive members of society, there's still that ongoing um, alcohol and drug treatment method, all the different treatments for that. That's being provided in perpetuity mm -hmm. by, by design uh, using the Rhode Island model, mm -hmm. for example. So I'm curious, is that in the, a course of action, so to speak? Um, for our region? You, I, regionally, no. I think what you have is each county has dealt with that differently in terms of the resources it's brought for, like, for example, sobering centers. So you have Hooper Detox up in Portland, which is probably the main catchment point for that. So when uh, you have an individual in Clackamas County who is uh, picked up uh, related to, um, you know, under the influence, um, you know, if they're not operating a motor vehicle, uh, they maybe they may be transported by ambulance up to Hooper, uh, or they may actually uh, be transported to the jail to dry out. Um, we don't have a sobering center in the county. So, and you're talking about significant trip times uh, that tie up law enforcement and ambulance. Mm -hmm. And th some th th those are needed. Those are needed health uh, needs. And so I don't actually begrudge that use a resource, but we could certainly use something down here in the county. We have not planned out uh, at this point for that as it relates to the supportive services for housing. You know, we, we do look at it, we are addressing a housing first model, which is looking at, you know, you taking folks where they're at related to their addictions issues and um, getting them housed so that they can relax, feel safe, and then we move into uh, addressing their addictions issue. And so we are going to be actually spending an enormous amount of time programming that out in this coming year because we do know that that's a gap. But how we do and create and fund a sobering center, we have not sat down and talked about that at this point. 
Um, I've been spending a little bit more time looking at how we might create a permanent shelter in the in the county because we do not have one. Trying to look at maybe po possibly developing a hub and spoke model where we have a large center that is for sheltering and is permanent, it's twenty four seven open, and then looking at um, how do we feed folks into that for case management, identification, tracking, so we get to know the population, and then we can begin to address some of these larger issues. Um, but that's a that's a big lift. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't actually I have not ident identified. I was going to actually have Vahid identify that funding source. Well, yeah, um, well, well the, the parallel there is you know to mental health and the jail shouldn't sure. be a place for for, should for people suffering mental health, nor should it be for people that are drawing out. Right. I mean they need the treatment. So the parallels are there. Right. I mean yeah. it's and in this case talk about jail capacity. It's using up jail capacity mm -hmm. that otherwise might might be opened up for people that don't have those challenges. And <laughs> I'm sure there's people that have drug and alcohol challenges, and also have mental health challenges. So there's crossover. Yes, there is. Uh, with, the, with the same kind of patient. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to go back to your PowerPoint, I think one of your first slides, and on uh, one of your measures, and it was percent of people that received a response within two days. And I want to, the key word in that, um, I think was response. So is, um, what, Response versus actually receiving the treatment mm -hmm. is are they not synonymous in a in a sense? Are they? I mean, how? I mean, do you have a measure that actually says, you know, ninety five percent of all people seeking behavioral health services will receive treatment within X amount of days? Do we have a measure like that? We we do not. You know, what we're trying to do is um, when someone uh, needs that service, what we are trying to do in terms of response is at least a phone contact. Um, what we, what we, the health centers have actually gone to same day appointments across all of their um, offering for behavioral health. And so what you're trying to do is as the need comes up, get them into the clinic so they can be seen by someone. A lot of these uh, with the behavioral health uh, response within one business day um, actually sit within what Mary described as the crisis response where you've either had law enforcement or you've had ambulance involved in, in care, and what, we, what we're trying to do is follow up those individuals within one day to see what they would like to do next. Some folks refuse services. We can't mandate that service, and we can't mandate them to um, attend treatment. And so what we're trying to do at that point is establish a relationship if we do not have a relationship with that individual. And you know, part of that problem is that you're dealing also with, if it is in house this individual, an extremely transient population. Uh, who is difficult to um, track and, and pin down. Right, right. Um, and I have a question like, I'll wait for later, but there's one I do have right now. How are we doing the point in time count? Is that, we have the results back yet on the point in time? Want to come up? So it seems like everyone's raising that issue right now. How are we doing? How are we doing? Eric, do you want to speak to that? So we're doing come up to Come on up. You don't have to write your name on the card. Introduce yourself. Sure. Commissioner Savas, um, yeah, we do have the point in time count data, and it's not uh, a significant deviation from the trend lines over the last several years. So the overall, there's a small increase in the number of unhoused people, um, a less than 10 percent, which is consistent with previous trends, and within sub communities of folks that we count. Um, Chronically homeless in particular, um, significant jump there. Um, we saw also some significant increases by um, race and ethnicity categories. And that's, I mean, that's also consistent with previous kind of trends where um, a, a large jump in the number of people who were counted as homeless who were black African American and uh, Native American, Alaskan uh, Native. Bo both of those communities saw significant increases. Um, but overall, we, we didn't see anything super dramatic. I mean, I think that the largest um, uh, kind of paragraph that we'll need to um, describe a, a change that we saw in the numbers was in the unsheltered numbers. So that was a 54% increase from 2015 to 2017 and a significant decrease from 2017 to 2019. So do we have fewer people who are unsheltered, who are living outside without any um, place to be that's, a, that's meant for human habitation? No. What happened is that on the day of the count this year, we had a lot more warming shelter capacity and it was a very cold day. And so a whole lot of the folks that we counted were sheltered because they were sleeping on a church floor, right? And so those are not people who are housed, who have a place that's meant for human habitation they can go to. 
that day they were able to uh, be in one of our warming shelters. And so that's a number, a, a trend we'll have to kind of be, you know, careful to explain so it, it doesn't give the impression that a lot fewer people are living outside. Mm -hmm. So uh, Derek's up here. Um, I'll allow him to introduce himself. Uh, he's been working on the point in time count and give us the status of where we are with that. Yeah, so uh, Derek Ranke with the, uh, with the director's office in H3S. Uh, we should have those out next month. I've given some preliminaries to, to Vahid and to social services. Um, I think one of the biggest differences we're still struggling with a little bit is some of the school data that we've gotten from our, our uh, liaisons. So last year we reported about 1,100 that were that schools had contact with, and we tightened up our definition a little bit so it matches HUD a little more closely. And then we only have 500 this year, so that's I think there's some data differences that we're still wrestling with a little bit as we try to to write out the the overall report. Um, but comparable, the the more comparable apples to apples from last year was um, a little over a thousand, and this year it was about 1,100. So similar overall numbers. Um, and I think the unaccompanied youth is, youth is another area where we, yeah, I think there's some data definitions that, that look like they're driving trends, but um, <laughs> I think actually the changes are pretty minimal. Okay. Uh, Fahid, you said something that just kind of struck me. So the, yep. if the count is up 10%, but the chronic is up much higher, can you explain that? That sounds a little odd. Yeah, so the overall number of people, like the, the apples to apples group, that's sort of the, our HUD reported number, as a community, that that the number it hasn't didn't jump from from January two years ago to this January, but we did see that the the number of those people who are now reporting that they've been outside for a year or more or have had four or more periods of homelessness in the last three years and have a disabling condition is growing, and that may very well be just simply because people we counted two years ago who were at that time less than a year without housing are now more than a year without housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Schrader, then Commissioner Humberston. Okay, thank you. Um, I've just been looking at page three, uh, and a lot of my questions uh, really are going to kind of revolve around the public health division, and and it's because I think I know <laughs> what what a lot of this means, but just again for the public and just to make sure I'm understanding things. So when you go under administration and the and the First column there under the public health. Okay. I'm talking in the budget document, okay. page three. For so public health. Yeah, like when you look at, I know what. I'm pretty sure I understand what environmental health means because you're sending people out, pools, restaurants, so on and so forth. So when you're talking about pub, population health strategies, is that things like immunizations? Is that? I mean, can you mm -hmm. can you flesh a little bit of that out? Out sure. Me, just well, actually, so, well, I'll, yeah. I'll give Julia an opportunity to come up here sure. and introduce herself and uh, have a little time with the okay. budget committee. I think I mean, but I'm trying here. to get an idea of what the functions are. You know, what, okay, what, what activities is that? Sure. For our population and strategies team is a um, sort of that the, um, things that affect the full population. Um, that's where our opioid prevention um, okay. programming is yep. housed, or tobacco prevention. They're also embarking on some climate, um, climate and, and what we call non-regulatory environmental health. So that's, that's not the licensed facilities that our environmental health team, but things like um, air quality, water quality, mm -hmm. okay. climate, walkability of communities. Um, that team's interfacing a lot with housing to um, uh, be sure uh, housing redevelopment uh, supports the health of the population that lives there. Um, so, broad population policy work program work. Okay, that, that helps with that. And when you say access to care, I mean, for me, that means that people have an opportunity to get the medical, their primary medical needs met. So, what, how do you manage, how do you make that happen under, under the access? Because you have Sure, to care our piece. access so, to care, care program um, is where WIC and our maternal child health um, okay. home visiting program. So a lot of that is uh, referral case management. So they may have the resources, they may have the health insurance, but not know where to go. Um, dental navigation, they've got dental insurance, but they don't have a dentist. Okay. So they do a lot of warm handoff referral uh, management in that team. So it's really getting down to the populations through various mechanisms and 
again, doing a warm handoff to make sure. Yeah, that team's the also looking at trying to coordinate with all the other folks in the county that do those kinds of services. So we're doing some systems um, systems work, assurance, um, our reproductive health program is there. We don't provide reproductive health services, but assure they're available at a cost and a time and in a language that the population needs them in. So some of that's um, surveillance and assurance work along with referral and case management. Work. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Again, I just wanted to, to get that out there. So when we go to the Center for Public Health Advancement, what kind of functionalities are we talking about there? Yeah, so about 15, 18 months ago, we sort of restructured right. um, public health, and the center was designed at that point to support the modernization of public health mandate. Okay. Okay. Um, and. Uh, in the modernization of public health are what are called foundational capabilities uh, around policy, communications, leadership, data, um, emergency preparedness. So the, um, the center acts sort of as a consulting team to the rest of the program. So they support the programs and all of those, those things I just named. So they would support that population health strategies and policy development. They, they do the data surveillance um, epidemiology, population health data surveillance for us, and emergency preparedness. So they're kind of a, the a consulting firm that's got their <laughs> fingers everywhere into yeah, yes, making this yes. happen. Okay. Um, I think I get infectious disease control and prevention, um, <laughs> and and the reason being that I I. Just an anecdote, if you don't mind. I was trained as a pollination ecologist, but I actually almost went into medical entomology, where my specialty would have been uh, bubonic plague, mm -hmm. which, of course, is an infectious disease that is actually still uh, yes. an emerging, actually, threat mm -hmm. um, because it's transmitted by rats mm -hmm. and fleas mm -hmm. hopping. Mm -hmm hopping over, so I'm assuming that's the kind of thing we're talking about Not there, much so. plague in um, not, not Clackamas County, but not, yes. Not specifically, but <laughs> yeah. that is an example not, of yeah. the kinds of infectious diseases yes. that were... More we're recently, measles, as you were all yeah. familiar with, yeah. and yeah. Um, we really monitor case contacts, so all of the reportable diseases reported by clinicians or laboratories, there are a mandated list of 50 some odd diseases that must be reported to public health. And we investigate every one of those, who that person's been in contact, enforce isolation or quarantine rules, and uh, okay. you know, and then assure that the case is getting the treatment that's necessary. We don't provide the treatment, we assure that they're getting treated. And I imagine there's a nexus with the CDC then, Center for there Disease is. Control, yeah, yes. a big nexus. And then part of that would be the climate change piece, because as the climate is changing, we're seeing vectors of disease, mosquitoes, for mm -hmm. example, that are moving right. into areas with diseases we haven't right. really. We do have cases of Zika with. in Clackamas County. They contracted the disease in other locations, so the case contact is mm -hmm. you know, not um, something we have to monitor. But um, So, so far, climate-related diseases in Clackamas County are um, minimal, but we're expecting we're that expecting to, to see. increase, um, particularly um, the harmful algal blooms that you had heard so much about in the Salem, Marion County area. Last summer, um, that's believed to be a, a result of warming temperatures that those okay. those algae grow in the drinking water. Okay, so. thank you for that. And then I, then I'm switching over to admin with veterans services. Um, and okay. Rich, I think you did or had already answered this for me, but I wanted to bring it up. Thank uh, you, Julie. Because from the ODVA, we we had not been spending all of our dollars. So we we kind of have we done that? Have we been able to to expend the dollars that they've we're in, been funding? We're in the to process us? of expending those dollars. And so what happened when we got an increase in funding? Uh, there was a delay in hiring staff because uh, the individual who's hired to actually um, fill that position for uh, a uh, veterans um, caseworker uh, was actually also doing other work at that time, and so. Before, so we had to hire that position in order to move them over, and so we had a bit of a delay. Okay. So there's a delay. Uh, we re actually reprogrammed some of that money, brought some temps in, and we do expect to uh, spend those dollars down. Thank you. That's. I think you had already mentioned mm -hmm. that to me, and I I do know I've got to mention this too that um, uh, I, that there's a little bit of a space problem with our with our VSOs. Are we? And this is probably an administrator question and maybe a facilities piece. I hear there's a little bit of crowding going on there, so uh, I don't know what our 
our future would be for, you know, expanding that, maybe getting a little more space there, but, but, but it might be a good thing to, to Well, look Brenda at. certainly has been struggling with space. Uh, they actually did a little bit of a reprogramming effort with public health and are moving some staff up into public health, uh, taking over some cubicles, renting some space from public health. I think they're going to take nine seats. Um, and uh, so for the, for the veterans office, uh, I know that they're, they are feeling a little uh, packed in. Yeah. Uh, we do not have plans at this point to, from a building standpoint, expand that space. Okay. I think we're probably, what we're trying to do is figure out, uh, for H3S, our overall footprint on this campus as it relates to um, Stewart, as it relates to Hilltop. And what are we going to do? And how are we going to do that? And are we going to move? I mean, in all honesty, having uh, the jail and the courthouse on the same campus as it relates to the populations that Health and Housing Human Services provide services to, uh, it's not a draw. And um, so we're actually looking at potentially trying to move uh, certain if not the bulk of operations off the Red Soils campus, just because uh, it's too much law enforcement presence. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And um, I'm I'm feeling as if this whole notion of space and how we manage it is not not just your. This is this is really countywide in all our it divisions. Is. So it is. I mean, there's also a generational yeah. issue. You know, uh, there's an expectation with the millennials, and I actually don't know the generational name that follows millennials um i guess i should but um I, and i'm I, sure someone's going to tell me after i'm done here um <laughs> that uh you know there's a ne different expectation about office space you know my kids if they have a laptop they'll work wherever they work yeah, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, yeah. uh personally working in a coffee shop uh drives me crazy but it's, uh, it's a distraction filled environment but other folk, it's fine, and um, so we are looking at what, what's what's our model for office. Uh, we do think there's a ton of sunk cost that goes into physical space, and when we look at trying to push dollars out in the community, um, it becomes yeah. a, you know, do I look at saying, folks, we set up a hoteling, so to speak, where they can park at different spots, but they don't have an assigned office space. It's a different way of managing things. It's, it's a completely different expectation across how you do how you manage staff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, I've been listening to some, some podcasts and some radio related to uh, organizations that literally don't, do not have physical space. And they come to meet on the internet, they come to meet over uh, Skype. Um, they're actually uh, completely located, in, they're located across the country. But they are a team that's providing s service and doing work. Um, and, and that may be something that we look <clears throat> to consider. Okay. But we are compressed for space in certain areas. Yeah. And I understand that. I've telecommuted from England. And actually, my colleagues may remember once that I had to get off the phone pretty quickly because my grandson tumbled down the stairwell. So there were there were some drawbacks. He was fine, by the way. But I have I think the tele, telecommuting, I think you're right, is changing the whole landscape of not, how millenni not just millennials and whatever the next generation is, but even for our age group, I've had mm -hmm. to to do that and you can work from anywhere so thank you so right, much you are welcome thank you okay. Um, okay we have two other cards up but a process um query for the budget committee we had been scheduled to take a break during this time if it would be preferable to just keep moving forward then we can complete all of our questions to mr swift and his team in this period of time and perhaps then um, break for lunch oh, just at moment. a little earlier time. Would that be permissible with everyone? Are you good with that? I would much rather we do that. And Rich and I have already talked about that, and so he's prepared oh, yeah. for that also. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. We have Commissioner Humberston and then Commissioner Fisher. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to echo uh, Commissioner Schrader's co concerns about uh, infectious disease. Uh, I know that uh, bubonic plague has been found in New River in Arizona uh, recently, and there's also large concerns about 
the melting of tundra in the northern regions, both of, of Russia as well as in the United States and Canada, and the diseases that have been long buried and that modern human beings have never been exposed to. So investments in, in health care are going to be uh, critical going forward. Um, that said, I, I do have some actual questions, um, and I'm going to go backwards. My first question is to Fahid. Um, he had indicated that there was a specific increase in um, homelessness or houselessness in minority communities um, more than I would assume the majority community. So I'm curious as to what your thought is as to why that has occurred. Those are um, um, trends that we see nationally. This is kind of larger context of um, the economic pressures of racism and white supremacy in the United States in housing policy and in, um, in economic policy writ large with respect to banking and property ownership. Um, gener intergenerational wealth differs dramatically um, in, in communities of color than it does in white communities. Um, it basically doesn't exist for many uh, black African American communities in the United States. Intergenerational wealth, that is. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just we're, that trend line isn't something, um, isn't a blip. It's not, I wouldn't attribute it to something um, recent. It's uh, the ongoing um, uh, disparities uh, uh, economically that communities of color experience and they continue to experience in Clackamas County. And so that's why, you know, regionally with the Metro um, Housing Bond, we have a regional commitment to lead with with racial equity, right? So that's the first value that leads the work as we develop new affordable housing. Um, and across H3S, uh, you know, that's, um, a, we all recognize across our, our divisions that um, communities of color have disparate impacts with respect to poverty and um, the social determinants of health. And so everything that we do, that's on the forefront of our mind. We had had a discussion about four or five months ago about an, uh, a, um, Resolution on behalf of the of this board regarding the impact of racism on on mental and behavioral health. Um, mm -hmm. Have we made any progress on that? Yeah, actually, we we have uh, the language on that prepped. Um, actually, asked public health staff to do two things: uh, to write up a resolution that sort of mirrored what we had received from the local uh, Democratic Party, and then also ask them from a generational standpoint because these were some younger staff, probably millennials. Um, I think um, they were younger than I. Um, let's let's just keep it that way. People yes. younger than us. Yes, <laughs> yes. Which is actually getting easier these days. Um, and uh, ask them to write up a, uh, a a more radical resolution. Okay. And so they've done that. And uh, what we were doing is actually waiting um, until budget was done, and that the the board of county commissioners had had some space to be able to. Uh, entertain that resolution. Maybe we do a study session and talk about that. Uh, there is no doubt related to uh, the health of the public that racial disparities have an enormous impact and an enormous cost on um, how we live our lives. Thank you. My um, next question to you, Richard. I think this came from your testimony today, but I'm not sure it could have been Mary. Um, there's a difference between the state view and our view regarding the, the numbers either going up or going down mm -hmm. with respect to the mental health mm -hmm. needs, uh, and consequently that would have a budget impact from at the state level. Um, do you have any idea what the basis of that difference of opinion is? Yeah, that was from Mary, so I'll ask Mary to come back up. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, the, the state actually requires most reporting to go through a system, uh, their system called MOTS, Measure Outcome Something Something Something. Sorry, my apologies for not knowing exactly that. And so uh, there's been challenges with that system, sadly, like many of their systems that Oregon Health Authority has launched. And so there's the sense that data sort of goes a little bit into a, a black hole and that we're, um, we're not, we, we feel confident in our data entry. We're not so confident on what they're pulling on the back end. And that's actually consistent across all of my um, CMHP directors across the state. So it's, it's really, we end up having to do hand counts uh, to justify why we believe our numbers are, are different than the state's numbers. So um, it's just ongoing conversations about uh, their, their data system uh, and the accuracy of that, that system. So do you think there's the 
um, financial slash political impetus on the part of the state to want to have lower numbers deliberately? Or do you care to answer that question? Well, well certainly, uh, I think we all want lower numbers, especially when it comes to uh, the civil commitment. Um, the, the, when Civil commitment is, again, a very high threshold, and it means we're actually taking uh, individual civil, civil liberties away. Mm -hmm. So we, we certainly are invested in only recommending a civil commitment uh, for individuals that we truly believe, um, you know, meet the threshold of being a danger to themselves or others. Um, but certainly the state is going to use that data. And if that data is showing a decrease, they are going to, they're going to justify why there should be a reduction in funding to the counties for uh, civil co the civil commitment process. So I, I think it's a fair argument. It's just the, the argument is n not fair in the sense that the data is inaccurate. Okay. And then my last one also to Mary. Um, you had indicated that there are a number of people that your department um, serves that have insurance of one kind or another, whether it's state-based or employer-based. I'm curious as to why they would come to your services when they have insurance. So um, when we developed the Urgent Mental Health Walk-In Clinic um, approximately seven years ago, it really was to be that, um, that urgent um, access point for anybody, uh, regardless of insurance and ability to pay. So I think the, the reason they come through our door is because it's an immediate face-to-face uh, -face contact that they will have. Um, versus regardless of whether you have Medicaid or commercial insurance, you're going to call a provider and you could be waiting one, two, three, four, five weeks. Um, we certainly want to encourage individuals who are in crisis to come to us, but we are also encouraging folks who are just really struggling. And so we will do some short-term uh, stabilization services, usually up to 30 days, while we are getting, while they are waiting for that that intake appointment, and and this actually is a great opportunity for me to to also comment on Commissioner Savas's question about are there other guidelines around this? You know, we have a we have the measure around meet the you know uh, the response need within one business day. On the Medicaid uh, side, statutorily, there is requirements for a non uh, urgent uh, appointments. Uh, that that individual be offered an appointment within 14 days. And then there's an um, emergent, which is three days, and then a crisis appointment within within same day. So there are standards, and we do monitor that, and most um, providers struggle to meet those standards be purely because there are more people in need of services than there is capacity mm -hmm. in the system. So are you able to bill for those services? Uh, if they so have insurance. yes, we are. So we are on uh, many of those insurance plans, um, and you know we also want to make sure that that is not a deterrent, though. For for so some folks actually don't want to come to us. They'll call us on the phone, but they don't want to come in for services because they actually don't want. They might have actually a pretty high deductible or copay. So we really work with individuals to make sure that we will do what we can to get payment from the. The commercial insurance, but we that should not be a deterrent for them to come and get services because, frankly, those individuals, if they're truly in crisis, are going to end up in our our emergency departments, and that is not certainly where people should be served. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Did you have another comment or question? I'm going to wait. I'll okay. Wait All right, and Commissioner Savas. Yep. <clears throat> this is because of the limited resources and and the pace of where we're headed as far as um, expenditures, outpacing revenues, and just the plight we've been talking about the last three days up here, frankly. My, my question, especially for you all, because you do with so many grants, um, how, in general, I know this is a broad question, but in general, how, what percentage of your staff are direct service providers dealing with the patient, let's just say, or the citizen or the recipient versus mm -hmm. the admin aspect of trying to trying to keep up with the requirement of the paperwork or mm -hmm. the grant, right? And I know that some grants in some areas have a requirement that X amount of the grant must go to service provision. Mm -hmm. And ironically, sometimes that just the uh, cost to maintain or to, to actually check the boxes and do the paperwork um, is really not f adequately funded. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're in this conundrum of how you actually satisfy that. So I'm kind of just in overall, in general, <laughs> what percentage are we spending on 
meeting the requirements for the paperwork versus meeting the needs of the patient? Well, you know, I always find when someone starts off with, uh, you know, in their answer, that's a really good question. It usually means they don't necessarily know the answer to it. No, it's broad. Um, I'm, I'm, so, but I wrote it down because actually what I want to do is uh, take, go and look at that FTE distribution. My guess is probably, I would say 75% off the top of my head, maybe more than that, are related to direct service, and the rest of that is that admin side. Um, related to uh, management, supervision, grants administration, finance. Uh, we, we have it internally for H3S, and I know this is also an issue for the county, we have an infrastructure issue in the sense that we actually don't have, you know, uh, for a long time I've had people tell me the director's office is, is, is seriously understaffed, and that's true, we are. Um, so we have nine FTE for a department of now close to 500 and, um, 60 FTE, somewhere around there. And uh, that's the way it is. That's the way it has to be. And uh, so it means we come in on a Monday and we run until a uh, conclusion of business on Thursday, and then we pick it up again on Monday. And for some of us, actually, that, you know, the Friday day is actually a day where we uh, meet with our partners um, and do other work. And uh, so, bless you. So anyway, um, I'd probably go with that 75 split, 75-25, but I'm actually going to uh, get that for you specifically. And that's, I mean, that's a more promising number, um, so I'm glad to hear that, and hope, hopefully you're, you're, it's close or as, as high. Um, but is there any technology or any innovation or any streamlining that's looked at to maybe make sure that maybe the process of checking the boxes for, for on the admin side is mm -hmm. somewhat standardized so that there's not a lot of variance or is there any mechanism in which to save some effort to, to, to assure that more, majority of those funds are going towards the patient care versus? Yeah. So actually, uh, one of the things that uh, I've tasked uh, Mr. Cook with uh, is a project for H3S that we're calling No Wrong Door. And that project is actually looking at, and we've already talked to um, Seth Lyon, who's the district manager for DHS here in Clackamas County, about how do we uh, work with our client, patient, whatever name you wish to assign to residents who are seeking services from H3S. How do we work with a streamlined process for them so that when they fill a format, they fill it out once? Because there is no doubt that when they are working with different offices across the county, which are, regardless of which bureaucracy they're interfacing, they're probably doing double, triple, quadruple, quintuple, uh, entry of the same information. And then also within H3S, we're looking at how do we streamline and think horizontally, not vertically, in terms of how we do our services so we can stretch our dollars and push our dollars out in the community in a, an aggressive format. It's going to take us a while to do that and, to, and look at how to, but that's also related to our Metro Bond in terms of the support of housing and the things that we're going to have to do to lean into uh, these residents because we're going to be, um, we've got um, let's see, Chuck, what's the name of the vet's shop that's opening up? Pleasant Avenue? Yeah, Pleasant Avenue is coming online in August. We have uh, PEDCOR coming online in April of next year, maybe even sooner. And then we're going to start having uh, more units coming online. And what that's going to mean is that we are going to have to be really good at how we do our service provision and push a lot of our effort out into service provision um, and be as administratively lean as we possibly can be. Well, as I opened up my question earlier on to you, um, I kind of spoke about the carryover in, mm -hmm. the, in the health care uh, mm -hmm. centers. And um, I just maybe asked that we just take a look at how we can maybe apply a sobering, well, alcohol drug treatment mm -hmm. aspects or services into our, knowing that the, f the fiscal health of those, the health care center seems to be strong and it's generating some revenue. And it seems, again, my point last year, um, uh, I'd like to see those dollars used for direct services, especially when there's a need. And I think when we think about the homeless, I think some people will be far more successful and maybe be able to put themselves back to work if they didn't have some of these addiction issues that are I agree. really driving people into poverty. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. Commissioner Fisher? And also in the packet of <laughs> information that we received, we have a listing of 
where our um, nonprofits, our money out to nonprofits, and we have um, what is our general fund going out to nonprofits, what is the subrecipient non-federal, which I'm guessing is state dollars to nonprofits, and then we have federal dollars to nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And H3S has the bulk of yes, state dollars mm -hmm. going to nonprofits and federal dollars going to nonprofits. But I'm not seeing that we have hardly any general fund going to our nonprofits through H3S. We have Clackamas County Fire District, Foothills Community Church, Hoodland Senior Center, and Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue, which shows that there's very little general fund. So I'm, my first quick question is, what, what, what is that general fund used for? Well, actually, in all honesty, if you look at how our general fund um, occurs, so we're getting, I think, a little bit over a million dollars in general fund. 1.2 of that is related to the housing efforts um, that the county has entered into. So you subtract that out, and we're around $10 million. Um, so across that $10 million, uh, a little over $7 million of that is actually then uh, goes to allocated costs within the county. Okay. So then, then there's um, probably a little under $3 million um, that is for staffing and then pushing out, uh, you know, so then you have SS, you actually have social services, and then you have uh, children, family, and community connections that are getting the bulk of that general fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it depends. It could be a lot. Rod Shop does push a lot of that out into the community. Mm -hmm. um, so I could, get, I could break out that detail if you want. I don't have that off the top of my head, though. Okay. Well, we have the list that our financial department put together, but it just shows how incredibly small our general fund contribution is to your department. And if you, and I didn't realize, I appreciate you saying that most of it, of that 11 million goes to allocated costs. Mm -hmm. So it's even less when you look at the 11 million in general fund mm -hmm. that goes out. So I just bring that up. So when we talk about this, our expenses are outpacing our revenues in your department, our um, challenges with lack of general fund isn't part of what we're dealing with with H3S. I think that's important for to bring uh, attention, mm -hmm. especially since we're going to be doing a pretty deep dive and looking at what are the county's priorities, what are what do we have to provide as a county, and where are we going to be committing our resources. And so with that, um, a couple years ago, maybe two years ago or last year, maybe I think it was two years ago in budget, I had asked you what were your um, what were the unmet needs and what would be your plan, your five part plan for homelessness, houselessness and, and affordable affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So this year I wanna ask, what are your priorities based on unmet needs in Clackamas County to somewhat provide a frame for us as a budget committee as we grapple with these issues? because we will be taking a deep dive into how we budget in this county and where we're committing our resources. Oh, so that's a, okay, so my priority. Um, <laughs> you did a good job a few years ago, Rich. Right, well, did, I'll try and did. do it again. I should have looked at my, should have looked at my uh, recording from that, those, that year. Yeah. Uh, regarding housing. Uh, well, and this is broad, this is department wide. This so is, this, this is, is the whole thing that I'm asking a, a about. A big priority is going to be uh, building the capacity for us to do the development work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, we are d definitively understaffed related to the development side of what we need to do for building units. And so we are, Jill and her staff are working like mad to get positions hired, filled. We have actually, um, I reached across the entirety of the department and took money from each division to create um, positions within the housing authority for us to be able to do development. Um, and you know, it wasn't hard. All the divisions kicked in. I didn't have to go and demand money or look for money. They all kicked in dollars. And um, we're not gonna be able to do that. To, that's all one-time dollars that we're pushing from other parts to be able to do this. Uh, so you have the development side in terms of creating units, and then you're going to have the uh, capacity for us. I talked about management in terms of supportive housing. So that's another key piece we're going to be focusing on. This is where the no wrong door comes in. Um, I do expect that we are going to be very lean in those areas. They're key areas. And then we get into behavioral health and substance abuse. 
So uh, that's working, as I talked about, the threat of harm assessment. It's, it's, it's working in the areas that Mary described in terms of maintaining our capacity to work with law enforcement. We work with nine different law enforcement agencies in this county, 16 different cities, uh, building that knowledge um, for what the service need is. You know, we, we're doing, and Vahid has done an enormous amount of work in sort of educating the different cities in the county to the fact that the, the, they have the issues that they say they don't. That there are addictions issues in every single city we have in the county and in unincorporated. And sort of beginning to build that, you know, the Clackamas County Houseless Coalition in large part, um, that's been a beautiful effort and I do attribute the, that coalition in some ways uh, to the work that the heat has done. And so we're gonna be maintaining that uh, and pushing that forward and beginning to build that community-wide response because that's what it's gonna take. But that's a heavy lift for the department to do. Uh, and then, and my focus is gonna be, um, you know, in my role as director, I'm gonna be really focused on the, on the housing side and on the behavioral health side. Public health uh, is gonna be a priority for me as we approach the FY21 budget and figuring out how do we fund appropriately for public health. Uh, you know, we've talked about plague. It's kind of sexy to talk about. We don't have, you know, and it's sort of exciting. I mean, if you have weaponized plague, it's a bad deal. Um, and so that's all hands on deck type of thing. But really what we're faced with are increasing STIs in the county and our uh, adolescent populations. Uh, we're faced with the fact that re related to sex sexually transmitted infection, we have drug resistant varieties now, <laughs> which if, you, if, a, if a child or kid is infected with those, this is an issue in terms of treatment. We have drug resistant TB. These things are on the rise related to the fact that antibiotics are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And actually what's happening now is healthcare has to bring in serious heavy hitters in terms of antibiotics that may or may not work. Um, so the toolkit's actually thinning out. And so uh, that's gonna be a priority for myself in FY21 figuring out um, how do we do the public health budget for the county. Another piece is generally healthcare. We've got some big opportunities with uh, HealthShare of Oregon and CCO 2.0. I sit on the finance, I'm chair of the finance committee for HealthShare. Um, creating you know, a larger uh, sense of the fact that, as we talked about with behavioral health, just because you have insurance does not mean you have access. And uh, I think we need to be more educated about what the realities are and the fact that um, a single payer system or socialized healthcare, as you wish to call it, um, is not socialism, it's just really smart. And, um, and if it's working in a whole bunch of other countries <laughs> who have not backed away from it but have expanded it, the United States actually has, has to take a look at this. You know, we've spent an enormous time talking about PERS. When people ask me what is my, one of my biggest costs related to staffing, it's not PERS, it's healthcare. PERS is a drop in the bucket related to what uh, H3S spends on healthcare. Mm -hmm. for its employees. And I do not begrudge the fact that that health care package is something that every single resident in this county should have. It's a standard package of health care that anyone should have. I'm utterly grateful for it, and I'm actually, and I'm happy to extend it to all of our employees. But the reality is uh, I, I spend a lot of money on health care. We spend a lot of money in health care. Um, so those sort of sum up the, I think the big priorities for us. And then also the Red Souls campus, that's gotta be a priority. That's something that I, I have to attend to. Um, I hired Adam Brown, who's here in the audience um, from Multnomah. They weren't happy about it, that. I was quite happy about that. <laughs> and um, you know, we're gonna be, he's gonna be spending some time focused on how do we do, uh, the, he's already working with all of the divisions in terms of how do we respond to the Red Souls campus relocation <laughs> and what that means for the county and what that means for H3S. And then I'll probably, we'll be, we're scouring for property and we're gonna be using the Metro money and other ways to acquire uh, dirt around the county for housing. So hopefully that mirrored what I did last year. And well, that, uh, I mean, that was a good project list. I was mm -hmm. kind of hoping for something bigger, broader, unmet needs, needs of the county, because we are looking at everything from mm -hmm. um, clean rivers, wastewater, sustainability, economic development and a lot of our funding sources are dedicated of course mm -hmm. you when you look at the carryover that you have your 30 million it's 
targeted to certain areas because yep. I'm sure it's mm -hmm. many from state or federal sources. If you so want to look I'm, bigger picture, you know, one of the things I've thought about is, you know, related to housing, related to health care, related to um, the county's authority as a public health authority in the county, the, you know, the board can convene itself as a local public uh, health board. Within that, the board does have the uh, auspices to declare an emergency related to housing. Within those auspices, it does also actually have the authority, as I believe, to uh, assess a business tax if it wishes to do something like that. Um, we've, I've looked into that a little bit. That is a big, bold move on the part of the county. Um, you know, some folks would not be particularly happy about that, but that would be a way for the county to look at uh, a response to some of the issues that are entrenched in it and that need response um, and that need local response. I don't know that we can count on the Fed as much anymore. That's a, that's, you know, a big, big ticket item for us. I don't know what's going to happen in healthcare. <coughs> and, um, you know, people think their Medicare is, uh, something that is going to be there. I don't know that folks should be that convinced at this point if, if we continue on the same path, along this path that we're walking right now. And so uh, if you really want to look at an item that is not a project but a big, big, big policy issue, that would be one. Um, because we right now don't have some of the tools to lift some of the big lifts we're going to need to do. Okay. So for unmet need, you would mm -hmm. say that supportive services for homeless and yes. those with challenges is the biggest unmet need yeah, and as at the local level are grappling with. Yeah. And actually there's huge unmet need on health care. We have the, uh, we, as Mary talked about, we have a workforce issue. And then on, also on the substance abuse side, we do not have, we do not have enough beds in the county for mm -hmm. folks who need treatment and to move them into treatment. Mm -hmm. And then on the mental health side, uh, you know, our response on the foster care side and for kiddos uh, needs some attention. Now that's not my direct wheelhouse. I've talked to Seth about that, but that is something that, you know, some counties are taking a look at what's the local responsibility if there is one. Um, and we've had some conversations about that. I was actually talked to Seth about that the other day. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Commissioner Humberston and then Commissioner Savas. I want to thank you for challenging the city's assumptions with respect to what is or is not going on in their cities. I've now completed eight of the uh, uh, ride-alongs that I intend to do uh, in uh, our law enforcement community. Mm -hmm. Every single city, regardless of economic demographic, has said the following issues are what they deal with day in and day out. Homelessness, mental health, domestic violence, theft, drug and alcohol addiction. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what is being said by city councils. Quite frankly, they need to talk to their police officers and see what's going on on the streets because you are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just real quick um, to uh, Commissioner Fisher's um, point and the whole, actually we're talking about priorities. Uh, you know, we've had in the past, and maybe I'm not sure we have had debt with uh, Commissioner Fisher or Humberston, but um, one of the retreat models we've used in the past was ha having the um, directors of the departments make um, or get engaged and make a presentation in a retreat setting to talk about what their priorities are, our priorities, and just kind of have a dialogue like this um, in which we try to wrap our head around and then followed by, you know, our own two, three, or four hours, or half a day setting, or a day setting, and talking about, okay, here's what we learned, here's what we heard, how do we put that together? And, and then, along with the zero-based budgeting process we're going through, I think we're almost forced to do that to some degrees, have those discussions, but putting it all together would be something we ought to entertain so we can actually carry this dialogue mm -hmm. along. I guess actually one thing I, I did leave off, which is, um, and it's because we're, it's a push that we're doing within the two pushes within the department um, strategically, which is zero suicide. And then, uh, and so, and, and the behavioral health staff and others for the month of May have done a beautiful job. I, hopefully you've seen some of the signs around the campus and some of the sign flying that we did um, and some of the videos. And then also uh, the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, that was, that's something that we're gonna be looking at. How do we do this better? Because he spoke to that a little bit. Um, it was just a touch in terms of some of the issues that we face and, and that some of the, the unraveling has to occur in order to actually create 
uh, an environment and in a community that everybody can participate in because right now um, there is exclusion occurring. I mean, for example, we have lost touch with pro probably approximately by our, our estimates, and we have no idea. Actually, we're looking at how do we do the outreach back into those communities, about 15,000 Hispanic uh, families in this community, in this county, that have just basically gone underground. Hmm. Fear. So they've gone underground? Well, in basically. the sense that it's very difficult for them to come into the clinics. It's very, they are afraid. And so how do they manage to function? And I don't how know. can we find them? I don't know. Well, they have to be safe, the, feel we, safe and secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, and they don't. And we try to communicate that, but yeah. we could probably do a better job and of if, doing that. And if you think disease and physical health issues will be, are a problem now, when you have a population that doesn't That's access health care, right. it will spread to everyone. You know, this, this idea that, that mm -hmm. somehow something happens in a specific community and it won't affect anybody else, um, wow. that's just plain nuts. At the local level, it is, it is not possible for the candidate to guarantee that they are safe mm -hmm. from um, being locked up. Yeah, this is a big deal, sure coast to coast, coast. Yeah. Um, especially now that the census is going to um, uh, be online uh, uh, early next year, and we're ramping up for that. But that's the biggest challenge. And, you know, the difficulty or the conundrum here is that um, a undercount results in less funding. I mean, the funding does. for everything we're talking about here today yes, comes from an accurate census. So yeah. um, it behooves us and them not to figure out a way to be participate in the count. For sure. Yeah. <sighs> I see no other question cards up at this point in time. Let them off the hook. Sure, for now. I'm happy to come back. We, we certainly appreciate all your presentation and your time and appreciate all the staff in yeah, our offices being here. Thank you so much. And um, just carry on. Keep okay. up the good Thank work. You. All just right. find those people that are underground. That worries me. So, Thank you very much.